this is one of the driest places on, on Earth. Sometimes it feels like being on the Moon or Mars. During the day is a fantastic place, but during the night is absolutely astonishing. Hi everybody, welcome to Women of CTA. Thank you for joining us in this very special event that as you know, we celebrate on the occasion of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. This is actually a very special edition. It's already the fifth edition. We've been doing this project for five years and we are extremely happy to keep doing it, to be able to gather experts in the field, amazing astrophysicists and engineers to talk to and to learn from. Because this was a special edition, we decided to change a bit the format of this event. So instead of focusing on presentations and then leave some room for the questions, we're going to do it on the other way around. This year, we want to focus on the discussion, on the round table. We're going to have first an introduction about the speakers done by themselves, where we can find more about their personal and professional background. And then we are going to move through a, a round table. But this year, we decided to divide it into three topics that you can see here. We're going to talk first about the future of astrophysics. We want to know the impact of gamma ray astronomy on society. Then we're going to talk about the situation of women in astrophysics. We want the perspective from the speakers. And finally, we are going to discuss about a very important topic for us, which is science education. We are going to understand the different ways in which we can approach science education from citizen science projects, more technical uh, data analysis to a more uh, multidisciplinary way, for example, through art. And to do that, to go through all these topics, we have today three speakers, experts in the, in the field. But before asking them to join me, let me remind you that if you have any comment, questions, if you want to participate in the discussion, please do, don't be shy. Leave a comment on Facebook and YouTube. You can do that during the entire event. We're going to actually pick some of these questions and raise them to our speakers so they can solve all your, your questions. So as I said, don't be shy, start already, say hi to us on the comments. We want to know where you are joining, joining from. And meanwhile, let me already invite the speakers, the main player of this event, our women of CTA of this year, Lucy Fortson from the University of Minnesota, Elisabetta Visaldi from the Politecnico di Bari and INFM, and Heike Prokhoff from DESI. Hi there. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. <laughs> so thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks again for accepting the invitation and being part of this panel. We are really looking forward to hearing from you and go through all these, these topics. Um, just very briefly, as I mentioned, we are going to start with your introductions. We are going, you actually are going to do those introductions one after the other, starting with Lucy, then Elisabetta, and finally Heike. So I stop here, I leave you the, the floor, and I see you in a few minutes for the round table. So whenever you want, Lucy, all yours. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Alba, and thank you um, to the organizers for giving me such a great opportunity to share the experiences I've had as a scientist, but also a woman uh, in science. And so what I thought I would do is sort of take you on a journey uh, of how I became a scientist and the work that I've been doing, um, and then end uh, with a little taste of what I am doing in CTA. Um, so, um, so yes, um, every uh, thing has a beginning, right? And I was born in 1962, which is for me already very mind blowing. Um, so. Interestingly, my first word was light. Um, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, where it was actually because of the rain, kind of hard to see the stars, but okay. Um, but I knew since I was 12 that I wanted to be an astronomer. And how do I know that? Well, of course, I remember that a little bit, but thanks to mothers who save things from our childhood, 
my mom saved this uh, little autobiography report I did uh, for my school when I was 12 years old. And I just underlined a couple of uh, key uh, sentences, which I find now quite funny that I, I wrote these things. Um, so at the top, uh, we have, um, so far I've only had babysitting jobs, but I would like to be an astronomer when I grow up. So that is uh, when I was um, 12. And then at the end of the report, apart from saying how much I love my cat, uh, I say, I really like um, the world now. I mean, the space age, um, so many different things are happening, both bad and good and exciting discoveries, but mostly because I'm a girl. So I find it interesting for myself to look back at my 12 year old self feeling such a strong identity of being both a scientist and a girl or woman. So that's fun. So that's sort of setting the stage. Um, of course, then, you know, we all uh, get an education. Uh, and so this is a photo of me in my high school graduation. Um, I went to Garfield High School, uh, which happened to be a health science magnet school in the late 1970s. Um, and so actually, I nearly got sidetracked into the field of genetics. But I stayed uh, true to my original calling. Um, and I joined the Motivated Astronomy Student Seminars which was an after-school science group that was uh, held at the Pacific Science Center. Um, and there I got to make a telescope. I met a bunch of astronauts uh, in the upcoming uh, American uh, Space Shuttle program. Um, and I got to take a field trip to see the 1979 total eclipse in Washington state. Uh, and quite significantly for me, as we'll see later, I got to hang out in a really cool museum with lots of really cool exhibits about space and get inspired um, by those exhibits. So then I went on to college. I went to a woman's college uh, and uh, by my senior year, I was actually a teaching assistant for introductory astronomy. And it is through that experience that I learned that I actually really liked to teach and I like to engage um, with uh, students with people um, to help them learn. Um, so that was uh, a fun discovery for myself. Um, and then uh, I just thought I would note here's my, on the right hand side uh, is a couple, you know, the title page of my um, honors thesis in which I, I investigated some uh, theoretical phenomena in nuclear physics. But on the right, you see a copy of uh, one of the pages in which I had to carefully write out the integrals. So this was before there was any like real typesetting that you could do as a student uh, online. You had to uh, photocopy the page carefully setting the space enough for you to actually write out the equations. So just think about that when you're <laughs> uh, when you're able to actually do all this cool stuff online now. So, um, okay, so from there, I moved on to uh, getting my PhD at the University of California in Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, but most of my time I actually spent um, at CERN uh, in Switzerland working on the UA1 particle physics experiment. And UA1 is actually a very special experiment because it made uh, some Nobel Prize winning discoveries uh, for something called the W and Z bosons. Uh, uh, but those discoveries were made just before I joined. Um, and uh, so my thesis topic was actually looking for evidence of what we would call a fourth generation of a fundamental particle. Uh, and so um, I found that there really weren't any, uh, there was no evidence for a fourth generation. And, uh, uh, but one of the things I learned along the way is, you know, I had to do shifts sitting at this thing called the Megatech, which looked at the events within the detector. And I had to scan through thousands of those events. And while, you know, in some sense, this was boring, uh, at the other sense, it was you really, really learn the physics involved in the, in the process. So instead of just taking an analysis program and running the data through the analysis program without understanding the basics of it, uh, this really put us in touch with the data. Um, and this will actually become important later on in, in a couple of slides as well. Um, so I got my PhD in 1991. 
Uh, and then I stayed at CERN from 1991 to 1993, working on a solar neutrino project. Uh, but then I moved back to the United States uh, for a postdoc at the University of Chicago. At that time, I was really wanting to move into my first love, which was astronomy. So I was taking my particle physics training in my PhD and converting it, if you will, to studying space. Uh, and so I joined the Chicago Air Shower Array, which you can see on the top left there, which is a very large uh, area uh, set of detectors, uh, 1,000 stations spread over a quarter of a square kilometer. Um, and each of these stations was covered with four 70 pound sheets of lead uh, that we had to remove in order to get into the station to do any kind of repairs. So removing, uh, you know, 280 pounds of lead to get in was something I learned. Yo, hey, um, I'm pretty strong. I can do this easily. Um, and so um, once uh, we, you know, finished up with the gamma ray portion of the Casimir uh, survey, um, as a postdoc, I was left actually with this big detector and an idea of how I could use this detector since we weren't detecting any gamma rays, well, we were detecting a lot of cosmic rays, I could implement a new set of detectors, uh, Cherenkov uh, non-imaging detectors that allowed us to investigate the composition of cosmic rays and whether or not cosmic rays in fact came from supernova uh, remnants, which is something that had been uh, theorized. And that was something that we were able to show with the Casablanca array. So that was fun for me. That was, a uh, I got my first uh, funding uh, through that project as a postdoc uh, and uh, uh, my first real leadership opportunity uh, through that project. Okay, so then uh, things took a bit of a change for me at that point. Um, I uh, decided uh, instead of going into academia, I declined three faculty offers uh, in favor of taking a new kind of position, which was combining the ability to do research, so to continue my research program, but at the same time, instead of teaching undergraduates and graduate students, I would be teaching the public. So it's a combination of research and public education. And this was a position that was offered uh, at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, which is where I was at the time. Um, so I took that position. Uh, a lot of people tried to tell me, no, don't do this. You'll be ruining your career. You'll, uh, you know, you won't really do research. I'm happy to say I proved them wrong. I was able to keep uh, going with my research. I became the director of the astronomy department there. And then eventually I became the vice president for research um, at the Adler. And um, while there was, I mean, I could spend a lot of time saying things that happened during that period of time, um, including the fact that I got married and had uh, our son, Daniel. Um, but one thing I really wanted to note is that this job gave me a platform to um, advocate at the national level uh, for how to incorporate research scientists into museums to really make that step, that combination, that, that, that um, ability to remove the distance between researchers and the public. And uh, in fact, it turned out that, for example, the National Science Foundation and NASA at the time, they were very receptive to these ideas, and they started building in a lot of programs about uh, public participation and research. So that uh, led me to realize I had a voice and people would listen to it. And so to think carefully about how to use my voice and the power that comes uh, from the passion um, in using your voice. So that was an important lesson that came from that period of my uh, uh, work. While at the Adler, as I mentioned, I also was able to keep going with my research. Um, by that time, I had joined the Veritas Gamma Ray Observatory, um, but I also uh, did something really interesting with this public participation and research work, which was I co-founded a citizen science platform called uh, the Zooniverse. Uh, and so even with all my administrative duties, I learned that I was actually um, able to stay productive uh, if I just persevered, if I just kept going, um, even though, you know, I was uh, 
uh, you know, lots of uh, distractions were coming in. I just had to keep going, one foot in front of the other, and I could keep my research going. Um, so then, after many years at the Adler Planetarium, both my husband and I got faculty offers at the University of Minnesota. So here's where I ended up uh, in 2010. Uh, then I had to switch from this administrative role and moving towards uh, actually doing uh, more academic style work, ramping up my research in Veritas and my Zooniverse efforts and uh, starting to teach as well in the classical sense of teaching undergraduates. Um, this was quite uh, daunting, but I learned over time what a special example that I was because I actually had managed to go in a non-traditional career path at the museum and then come back to academia, which I have found uh, people are quite interested in that in terms of me being a role model for making that a successful um, progress. Um, and so uh, also just to say, this is uh, where I ended up becoming more and more involved in CTA. Uh, and uh, this is a picture in the middle of me with the uh, Schwarzschild Kude uh, prototype telescope, which is a precursor design for CTA telescopes. And so finally, to my role on CTA, uh, while I spent a lot of my early career doing hardware work, uh, when I moved to the planetarium, there really wasn't that opportunity to do hardware. So I moved more to software. Uh, and uh, here I want to emphasize that while CTA right now is in the process of prototyping and building out precursors and, and building the site infrastructure, so there's so much physical building that's going on and thinking about the building that's going on. In fact, there's much, much, much more to such a large observatory than the building. And so many of us are contributing in other ways. Um, so for example, we have to think about the science. And so contributions, uh, I made a few contributions to the Science with CTA document that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, I've been a member of the Speaker and Publications Office uh, to help get the word out about uh, CTA through uh, conferences and the like. Um, and then of course, I'm a member of the CTA Outreach Committee, given my experience with the uh, planetarium work. Um, and I'm also a member of the CTA US team in this prototype telescope project that I showed on the previous page. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that I'm doing um, most actively is building a software pipeline to detect uh, certain types of particle images, muons, that we require for calibrating the telescopes that are being used in uh, CTA. And there I'm combining the power of the citizen scientists uh, uh, on Zooniverse with machine learning that I, I'm working on here with my team uh, at Minnesota. So with that, uh, I will stop. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and your, the opportunity for me to share just a little bit about um, my career trajectory, and I hope I was uh, helpful in inspiring you in some way uh, to think about science. And I will now turn it over to Elisabetta for um, her uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Lucy. So I will bring you now through my journey, uh, through what brought me here as a, a woman of CTA uh, working in astrophysics. And I also have to thank Lucy because she gave a wonderful introduction to some things that I will tell you uh, in just a moment. So right now I'm here. <clears throat> I'm sitting here, let's say, on the right of this building in Bari at the Dipartimento Interateneo di Fisica. And you can see me in the middle of this picture. This is just a part of our uh, gamma ray group, as we call it. I'm in, right in the middle. And, and this is where I'm talking to you uh, tonight. And so maybe you all don't know exactly where Bari is. So this is Italy, and Bari is there in the, in the south. But I'm actually not from Bari. I come from Genova, which is up here in the north. And this is where, where it all started. And this is the view from, uh, from my room, from my house. So uh, Genoa is a, a beautiful city with, by the sea. And, and this is where, uh, let's say, I grew up. And since I was really a child, I had a true passion about nature, about science, about uh, building things. Lego was one of my 
uh, most uh, productive activities as a child and I was always very, very curious about everything that was surrounding me and this is why I decided to study physics and this is where I got my bachelor in physics. I studied in my hometown in Genova and I graduated in, uh, in 2003. But yeah, I had this uh, always uh, passion about the sky and astrophysics. And so in order to study astrophysics, I moved, uh, I stayed in Italy, but I moved a little bit uh, more to the east and I went to Trieste. And this is the view of Trieste. Trieste is in fact not very dissimilar from Genova. So it's again a beautiful city by the sea with some mountains, uh, exactly like, uh, like my hometown. And this is where I started studying astrophysics and I took a master in astrophysics and space physics. Here you have just a few pictures uh, with me at the graduation day. So it was one of the always one of the uh, happiest moments when you finish uh, your, uh, let's say, your, your studies and you find you, you really made it at some point. And I just put another picture there with a friend of mine on the top right. Uh, in which uh, at Carnival we decided to dress up like uh, teachers and like, uh, let's say, I, I decided to dress up like a galaxy. You can see I'm full of stars uh, all around. And this was what I was doing all the time. So what does it mean to study astrophysics? So uh, this is probably uh, a galaxy uh, very similar to the one in which we are in. Obviously, we are in the middle of the galaxy. So we cannot really take a picture of our galaxy. So this is just an example galaxy. And where are we? So I mean, we, the Earth, the Sun, where are we? We are basically on one side, on one arm, it's called, of a galaxy. Uh, and what I wanted to study was exactly how, how, the, how this all is made, how, it is, how this can be possible. And so this is where, let's say, I started studying astrophysics from how are we made, of what are stars, why do stars gather informations like this. But my curiosity went even beyond this. And what you see in these pictures are a lot of galaxies far away at extreme distances. And in particular, I started studying stars that are inside these galaxies far, far away, which explode. So my interest was in exploding stars. And these exploding stars are called gamma ray bursts. And you can see a couple of animations here. On the left, you have a long gamma ray burst. And on the right, you have a short one. And these are basically extremely, extremely powerful events, which exploding create a black hole at the center and they emit two very powerful jets of material that is traveling towards the earth towards us and they can produce gamma ray radiation that we can measure on the ground but really the emission that we are observing here has been produced very far away it's very powerful and it's very difficult let's say to go and to detect it so how can we detect it? In order to understand how to detect it, I did also a summer studentship at San Francisco at the Stanford University Linear Acceleration Center back in 2005. And there, apart from studying astrophysics, I studied how you build a detector in order to detect something, to be able to measure something, to catch these gamma ray bursts that I told you. And this is a picture of the Fermi spacecraft, which has been then launched in 2008, and it's taking data since 15 years. And this is me in San Francisco doing a little bit of sightseeing, but also visiting laboratories and learning how really to build this kind of uh, this kind of uh, amazing detectors that in this case are satellites that are orbiting around our earth studying the universe in gamma rays then i moved again so astrophysics is also a lot about moving as you can see i was moving basically for all my life every three four years i was always moving around and i went to munich and in Munich, I did my PhD, so I took my, my degree from the Technical University in Munich, but I did, let's say, part of my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, which is near uh, Munich. And I just put you here a couple of pictures of me the first day when I started with the 
PhD school with all the other international students. And about the last day when I finally got my degree, and if you see, there is a very curious hat on, <laughs> on top of me because it's a German tradition that when you get your PhD, you are you have to wear a hat that is particularly significant and maybe you can see these two yellow jets which mimic a gamma reverse that is exploding on my head because this was my main thesis topic and so my friends prepared this kind of hat <clears throat> and put it on me during uh, so let's say after for celebrating uh, for celebrating the event traveling again so for my postdocs years i moved uh, towards the south. I started with moving to Innsbruck at the Astro and Particle Physics Institute, where I was a researcher for three years. And there I also had a lot of uh, fun in uh, skiing and hiking. So not only, let's say, doing research, but also enjoying the time and the beautiful nature surrounding this wonderful, uh, this wonderful place. And then I moved back again to Italy in 2013. I spent uh, again a couple of years in Trieste where I studied. And I just put a, a picture of me in Ljubljana, which is in Slovenia. It's in very next to, very near to Trieste. It's another beautiful country that is very easily uh, reachable from, uh, from Trieste. And then finally, with uh, another let's say fellowship, uh, I went all the way south to Bari, where I am now at the physics department of the Politecnico, where I, uh, in 2021, finally got my professorship at the uh, Politecnico of Bari. And here are just a couple of, uh, of last pictures of me uh, visiting the very famous Trulli in Puglia on the right and uh, at the seaside uh, in Bari uh, on the left. So Lucy mentioned the prototype Schwarzschild telescope, and this is basically what I was doing for the last 10 years. I was developing new photosensors for the camera, which is on top of this very large, uh, of this very, very large telescope here for CTA. So I, my interest was basically towards hardware, but also then data analysis because once you produce your hardware, you need to test if it works. And so you need to be sure also to be able to analyze it. So it's always balancing between analysis and hardware. And you can see the inauguration of this telescope in 2019. And this telescope, which is a very heavy, heavy, heavy telescope, can also be repointed in the sky in order to follow your source, your preferred sky point. And another instrument always part of CTA project that I'm involved in is the very large <laughs> size telescope LST, which is on the Canary Island. And you can see it also moving here in this very nice video. It's being also developed in 2019. It's already taking data. We have several of our PhD students here in Bari who are now actually there on La Palma. Uh, using this wonderful instrument uh, for the first time. So, so it's really a very, uh, very nice moment for us uh, uh, testing this, uh, this incredible telescope. And unfortunately, I didn't have the, the, the luck to go on La Palma yet. And this is just a picture of me, well, of my computer last year having a remote shift at the telescope, checking that everything was working. I wanted to finish with all of the activities that I'm doing apart from teaching first year engineering student. We are very active in Bari with high schools doing a lot of, uh, let's say, one day events like the International Cosmic Day, the master classes, but also the involvement in the European Research Night uh, every September, the last Friday usually, and then also giving invited seminars and schools and public events. So here you have just a collection of pictures of us at Bari with, uh, with people uh, of schools uh, and around the public events. So I will thank you for your attention and I will leave the floor now to Heike. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elisabetta. Um, and hello to everyone online. Um, I'm Heike Prokop. I'm working as a postdoc at DAISY in Zeuthen. So and the nice thing about this campus is that for my current office of the day in the DAISY department, 
I have a wonderful view onto the construction side of the Science Data Management Center, which is also just located between my office and the, the lake, which we have here. So it's a really nice opportunity also that I'm also part-time already seconded to the CDA Observatory. And when I was starting to prepare my self-introduction, I was basically asking myself, what is actually my job profile? And I ended up with the five different things which um, are listed here. Like I'm an astrophysicist by education, I'm doing a lot of R&D and science. And I'm also specializing nowadays heavily in IT. And in between all these activities, I usually also do a lot of education for young students and also trying to communicate the science we have to the broader audience. Um, but let's have a look a little bit on my uh, career path. It's a rather linear way if you look from it. Um, I studied university in Leipzig and I did that with a normal diploma uh, in physics. Um, where I graduated in 2009, but I also already started to get active into research by taking up a diploma thesis um, at DESI in Zeuthen already. So I had a great opportunity that I talked when I was looking for a new uh, thesis topic. I talked with different departments and one person said, well, you are interested in astrophysics and you are interested in particle physics, so let's combine that. There's one institute which is doing ice cube, and they are combining astrophysics with particle physics. So maybe you should go there, and that's what I did. And that's also brought me directly from my diploma thesis also into uh, studying a PhD, which I did together at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And there I also graduated in 2013. And I did that with doing uh, lots of involvement in gamma ray astronomy. I was highly active on both research already with CTA. So all the time after that, I also was more and more uh, getting into the research of CTA. And I took up after my PhD, I took a different postdocs position all within Europe. So I started with a two year journey to uh, the middle or the south of Sweden. I learned there a lot and it was a great opportunity to really get into detail, uh, into contact with a very different uh, people, different language. So that was a really fun experience. Um, and then I came back to Berlin for a bit before I moved on to Amsterdam, which is just uh, close on in the next country. And there I worked uh, with uh, David Berger on a little bit more hardware experience. And after one year, the whole group of Amsterdam was moving into back to Desi Zeuthen because uh, David just got a new P uh, position and he moved together with me back to Zeuthen. So that's why I'm back at Desi. And I'm here again since 2018. And as I said, most of those career uh, time, I was always involved with the CTA project and everything was related to gamma ray astronomy. So from the scientific expertise, in the beginning, I worked with the Veritas telescopes um, together also with Lucy, where we studied the uh, high energy gamma ray emission from active galactic nuclei. So these are super massive black holes, uh, which are rotating and emitting these big jets. And those are highly variable. So I focused a little bit on the long-term observations of these objects. And I also started to look into different methods, how we can actually improve our observation strategy with the Veritas telescopes and later on also with the HESS telescopes to get most of the data out which we can gather. So um, one of the things I did there was really to look into how can we combine data from different observatories which we have uh, open access to like the Fermi satellite and how we can use these to predict when one of these AGN is strongly flaring and where we can get a lot of gamma rays out. 
and that um, I followed up on that a little bit more with with HES, where we also not only looked into Fermi satellite data, but also already started looking for gravitational wave events, which have much bigger area because they are not yet all perfectly uh, uh, well in all. Uh, yeah, basically the source localization on the sky is still very broad. But in the end, we developed new methods on where to find the best spot for the electromagnetic counterpart. And that's basically really good start also for CTA where we can really start to scan more of the regions where potential gamma ray candidates are to make a little bit better science once CTA comes out. And then I also not only looked into the, the scientific part of the gamma ray astronomy, but I also worked on more than 10 years in research and development within the CTA project. So I would say, in principle, I basically did everything you can think about what you can do in CTA, except for touching steel. So I have never worked on a steel structure of the telescopes. But most of the other things, from simulating how the air shower uh, develops in the atmosphere, where to best put the telescopes in order to get most signs out of it, um, into looking into how the image and how the Cherenkov light inside the camera looks like, how we can reconstruct it, how we can discriminate against all kind of background noise. And then, as I said, in Amsterdam, I, I worked a little bit more on the hardware side. So I was involved in working on the developing the electronics for the prototype of the small size telescope. Um, and I also got more and more into uh, a technical thing, which I would call more the uh, computing part or the IT part of it. Namely, I was highly involved in developing a system how we can actually distribute time and clock sickness within the whole uh, CTA array. And the reason why this is important, if you look at how the shower is formed, Basically, the Cherenkov light front, which we detect on ground, is only a few nanoseconds long. So if you don't know how long a nanosecond is, it's basically that length. But if you now compare those like 20, 30 centimeters to the array side, which will be more than uh, three square kilometers, where all the telescopes are located in the south, then we have a problem because if we can have one nanosecond or a few nanoseconds, and we need to timestamp our data in the Cherenkov camera, we also need to make sure that timing sickness at all the different telescopes is actually the same. And to do that, um, the CTA observatory is now basing all the time distribution system on a so-called thing like White Rabbit, which was developed at CERN for uh, particle accelerator so that they really can tag their data or timestamp their data at the different detectors and they know when things are happening. But it's now very nicely becoming an IT standard all around the world and also at the uh, stock markets, they are already starting to deploy this technology. So you see that not only we are doing a lot of research and a lot of development just for making CTA working in the end, but we also use technologies which are really at the front of where we can actually think of at the moment. But since this is now more and more getting technical, so from starting at my PhD thesis with a lot of science, uh, I went through hardware development and now I'm in the IT department. Um, I also have the luxury of working at DAISY um, that I can also participate in outreach events and education. And one of the things we organize here and which Elisabetta already touched briefly is the so-called International Cosmic Day, where we really try to gather people from all around the world um, to make students experience the day of a scientist. So what do we do if we measure particles, we have a lot of different experiments, and in the end of the day, the 
students among each other discuss in video calls what they have found. So that's really a great event with more than thousands of students every year. And that is also something where I gain a little bit of the power back of why we are actually doing that, because CTA is now, I started this in 2008, we are getting to build this thing finally, um, but it's a long process which drains a little bit of power um, and energy. So it's great to also gain power from students and looking in their eyes when they discover something new. And the other thing is also that I also reconnected to the science objects by actually starting to draw things and really bringing a little bit of art back into life and enjoying beautiful pictures of all the objects we will hopefully see the CTA at some point. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and pass the floor back to Alba for the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Heike. Let's invite also Elisabetta and Lucy to join us here on the screen. So thanks a lot. I know it's not easy to summarize an entire career in 15 minutes. So thanks a lot for the effort. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. I'm sure the audience did as well. But let's start already with the round table, with the discussion. Uh, let's initiate with the first one that we call, we name it the future of astrophysics, uh, gamma ray astronomy. So one of the key points here, of course, we want to focus on gamma ray uh, astronomy, but this is an extremely down field compared to radio, to optical uh, astronomy, especially the grand base gamma ray astronomy that has barely 30 years old. So I wanted to start this section with a very general uh, question that probably you already heard sometime, that is what impact does gamma ray astronomy have on society or in other words, more commonly uh, heard, uh, what is gamma ray astronomy useful for? So <laughs> Lucy, if you want to start the discussion. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think you've actually heard some some of the um, the answers already in uh, the, the talks. And uh, just to reprise a little bit that, well, firstly, well, even though gamma ray astrophysics is studying things that are out there, and so maybe you don't think of them as being, quote, useful for planet Earth. In fact, you can think of it as being useful because uh, gamma ray astrophysics really um, probes the most extreme events uh, in the universe. And so like uh, things going on around black holes, uh, uh, exploding uh, stars, and these types of things that create huge amounts of energy. So how does that happen? This is a really, really big question. And so because gamma ray astrophysics explores these uh, large, big questions in space, this can be very inspiring for students and general members of the public to, to think about science and perhaps, and hopefully, uh, think about pursuing a career. Uh, so inspired by gamma ray astrophysics, um, you know, there is a, a path to, to a career in science. But the second thing which you heard um, uh, about is this idea that in order to build uh, something as audacious as the CTA, which is this amazingly large uh, <laughs> set of telescopes. Nobody has ever attempted something like this before, okay? And so a lot of new technologies had to be developed. And you heard a few mentioned um, by Elisabetta and uh, Heiko. Um, and so this kind of work that's being done, for example, with the prototype uh, schwarzschild kutte telescope, this is a telescope that was analytically uh, developed, if you will, uh, over a hundred years ago. We had not had the technology to even try building it until fairly recently, but it turns out this particular telescope design is perfect for what CTA is looking for, to increase 
the fine scale resolution, the resolution, the angular resolution, the ability to see things, if you will, more clearly on the sky, but at the same time, being able to see a much wider portion of the sky. So both wider portion of the sky, but very detailed images, okay? This is not something that is easy to do. And so we had to go back a hundred years to a, a solution that was derived by actually Schwarzschild, same guy who did a lot of work on, on black holes, an analytical solution. And then uh, Elisabetta and Heike and others have really pushed to get this um, uh, telescope actually functioning and working. Um, and we're really excited to see that technology being proved. So uh, I leave it to um, my other colleagues to make further comments. Yeah, yeah Elisabetta, will, if you want to yeah, comment. Yeah. I, I will comment exactly. So uh, taking into account what uh, what Lucy just said, so um, one particularity about, for example, this uh, schwarzschild telescope, since we are talking about this, is really that uh, we are taking a technology that is uh, really uh, the top of the, the state of the art right now, not only for gamma ray astrono astronomy, but in general for sensor physics. Uh, and we are applying it, we are testing it somehow on astrophysics, which might seem something maybe more far away from society. But in fact, uh, what we are testing for gamma ray astronomy, then we are taking the same piece of sensor, maybe modifying some characteristics a little bit. And then we are using it, for example, for an MRI machine at a hospital, for example. So what you are trying to develop, so our departments that are testing uh, laboratories, uh, research and development of sensors is not only closed within the physics department because we study the sky, but you can use it, you can test this technology now, which is state of the art, and for example, use it for another instrument, which is a medical instrument, and bring it to a hospital, which is a place that is a little more uh, near to the imagination uh, and to the sensibility maybe of uh, a, lo a, a larger public. And this is possible also when we go and study, for example, the gamma ray sky. I'm talking about sensors because this is exactly what I'm doing, but these are sensors that are not dissimilar also to the ones that we are using in our mobile phones. So there is a technology that was built for astronomy that then is used for cameras, for uh, taking pictures uh, or something like this and maybe people don't know it that the development has gone through these steps and now it's for granted somehow but it goes also through uh, this kind of studies so for, for me this is what brings me most near somehow to society so fills the gap a little bit yeah maybe, maybe also the, the technology has uh... Uh, medium term, even short term impact of society while the scientific discoveries take a bit uh, longer, no? But uh, actually, I, I like a lot when you started, Lucy, uh, mentioning that we are observing the, the most extreme uh, sources. And actually, that is something that we cannot study here on Earth. So uh, there is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum of the gamma rays, the most energetic ones that cannot be even produced here by human uh, created uh, accelerators. So if we do not observe the universe, there is a part of the of the physical or the knowledge that we are missing. No, so uh, actually I want to go through this through the through the science and. Let me, of course, focus in on, on the CTAO. So my next question is what discoveries can we expect from CTAO and, and how they will change the knowledge of our universe as, uh, as well? Our audience might know CTO will soon become an ERIC and European Research Infrastructure Consortium. And with that, we will start, we will kick a start, as we said here, the official construction of the first ground based gamma ray observatory. So, community is very excited about that. Uh, but why? Heike, maybe you can comment on, on this. Yeah, that's a very good question. I always hope for the very much unexpected. Um, but let's say from the current experiments, like the Veritas 
magic has lasso, we know that the gamma ray sky and the very high energy gamma ray sky is full of lots of sources. So we already know something like 150, 200 different sources. And with the much better sensitivity, the CDA will for sure detect those sources, will detect much more of these sources like active galactic nuclei, for example. And we can, with much higher sensitivity, we will be able to detect them in shorter time. We will be able to detect them over a longer time because we have in the north and in the south two sites which can observe at least part of the sky overlapping. So if you have, for example, a gamma ray burst, um, which goes off very bright and we point our telescopes there with the northern array, we can also follow them up if we are very lucky with the southern array. So we can make really detailed time evolution studies of the sources and how these extreme high energy particles are accelerated by really looking in the gamma ray sky. And the other thing is because the energy resolution or the energy range of CTA will be so much longer. So we will detect for sure we will find some more pavatons, which I'm certainly not an expert. But if we can observe like 100 TeV gamma rays from one steady source, maybe near the galactic center, then we will learn so much by just looking at it and staring at it for a long time that that will help us a lot and with all those new observatories like the radio, uh, SKA or LSST we have so many more chances to observe simultaneously to really look into the sky and make the connections between highest energies lowest energies and really try to understand the sources by themselves and not only making a stamp collection, but really looking very detailed into sources. And maybe we detect something which we haven't seen yet. So pretty sure there is something out there, which hopefully we haven't seen. Uh, but even if not, we still have this great observatory with this very good time resolution where we can really look onto sources in very much detail delve into what we know now and improve and expand our knowledge no elizabeth and lucy you are also very involved on the cta project on the development scientifically and technologically of the observatory so i want to hear also from you uh, beta for example you especially in the multi-wavelength and, and multi-messenger yeah. you've been very involved in a was, lot of collaborations yeah, yeah, that you mentioned so while Heike was saying this, I was thinking exactly in this direction. I think another uh, amazing thing that we started already uh, experiencing since many years now is having very good instruments uh, all at the same time uh, operating from different points around the Earth or on the Earth. So all a fleet of satellite uh, satellites uh, and uh, different types of uh, detectors uh, or telescopes uh, that are built uh, on various parts of the earth on almost all continents uh, you can find a different type of uh, detector and, the, and the, the key word that was already mentioned today and it's one of the most fashion keywords in astrophysics now it's this multi-messenger so we are collecting uh, data light but not only light also particles these particles that you said are not produced by human beings at accelerator but are produced by our universe are produced within the stars the galaxies they come from somewhere and we put together the puzzle so if i think about how astro astronomy astrophysics started in which really i don't know the, the beginning uh, of uh, from from Galileo with the first uh, let's say with the first telescope to uh, all the rest of the development so there were always pieces pieces of the puzzle a piece at the radio wavelength a piece uh, in the optical looking for something and now we are getting wonderful instruments covering all of these different parts catching particle catching gravitational waves uh, that was the missing piece until few years ago and 
creating a complete picture to understand really the nature of what is out there, the nature of stars, the nature of what we are made in the end. So always uh, what, what are the constituents of, of the universe, of, of, of matter. So having all of these wonderful instruments and not only CTA, but also other are coming online over the next uh, 10 years. These are very long term projects. It's not something we start. I mean, also because of the technology, we said it's it's long and it's complicated. It's also expensive to build. <laughs> there are many, many <laughs> difficulties, obviously. And the key will be to have these uh, glorious observatories all working at the same time. And as Heike said, if something is exploding in the sky, we can follow up, follow up together. We are all connected with this incredible network of communicate, rapid alert communication, which is amazing. And this is also something that we get, have since not so many years in the end. Mm -hmm. And we can all together follow a source, follow something at all wavelengths with all messengers and find a question, a, an answer to our questions. So this is, this so is the it. only thing I would I would uh, expand on that both of you mentioned, um, but I would take the opportunity to expand is exactly the fact we have all these messengers across the wave band, but we can see how the source evolves over time. And this is something that we have missed as well, uh, you know, through my career, uh, just you, we are happy if we actually detect a source. And then we, we put together the information from uh, the radio or the x-ray, but maybe it's not at the same time. Uh, so we really are guessing a little bit how the source might be changing over time. Uh, but now we have this amazing opportunity with so many different detectors, um, not just CTA again, um, but all of these uh, multi-messenger detectors coming online, which are keyed to the transient universe. So we will begin to see how sources not only maybe flare, but how they that evolves over time. And it's that evolution in time which can tell us so much about the physics uh, that's driving these, uh, these sources. So it's the multi-messenger, but the time and evolution that we get as well. So it's really the, the, the era, the moment of the international cooperation at, at all levels for the technology, for, for the science. And actually this, uh, I mean, this remind me to the, to the open science concept, not the fact mm -hmm. that we are going to have also the data available to, to everybody. For the CTO, it's going to be the first time that uh, an, an instrument of its kind is going to have the data open and not only the data, the software, the the user support. So it's really moving towards a more open field where everybody can collaborate. And, and I really like this concept, uh, both for the technology, for, for the science. Um, let's keep moving. Let's go to our second block for today's discussion. We're going to talk about women in astrophysics. And of course, we have the pleasure to have here uh, three role models, even if it is, if not volunteering from you, <laughs> you are role models to, to the girls and women uh, out there. So um, I wanted to start this, this section with a positive note, with a positive um, question. So I would like to know what motivated you to pursue this career in, in science, kind to understand if that would work for other, other women uh, that are watching us. So, Elisabetta, for example, if you can start. Yes, so, yeah, as I, as I mentioned when I did my introduction, I mean, um, I was really very, very young, very, very young, I don't know, maybe four or five years old. I was uh, always extremely curious about everything. So I had the curiosity that I had always to ask why about everything. And this went on also, let's say, at school, at the elementary. Uh, I was always very passionate about, uh, in general, nature, I would say. So from biology 
to plants, so to understand everything that was surrounding me somehow. And what I loved from the very beginning, uh, so I studied at the German school, so I was learning German and Italian at the same time at the elementary, but I was learning actually three languages because I was loving mathematics. And for me, mathematics was like a third language. So it was so clear and uh, somehow so it always guided me from really from the very from the very beginning. And then when I grew older, so going through middle school, high school, it became clear to me that below. So the mathematics was the language, but the basics of it all was physics. Physics was the basics for me for everything, for chemistry, for biology. So there was always the physical, uh, so to say, foundation of it all. Uh, and, and so for me, it was really na natural. So it, I, I always had this, this passion and I, I, I wanted to pursue it. Uh, and so when I had to, to decide, OK, now I'm going to university, what should you study? Well, the more basics of it all is physics, obviously. <laughs> so and so I went directly through physics. But yeah, as, as also Lucy mentioned in her in her uh, um, at the beginning in her presentation, uh, this passion about the sky, I, I had it always because the sky was what truly was amazing me every time. And so from physics, then I took the turn. <laughs> towards uh, towards astrophysics but when i was somehow a little bit uh, more mature in order also to understand if it was uh, really possible so this is my experience i don't know if lucy or heike want to to comment i mean it's it's very similar i i uh, for me um i had uh you can say an advantage if you will but my father was a physicist um, as well. So I was, yes, I know exactly. Yes. And so, so I was, um, you know, he would, uh, drive me to school, uh, early on and he was teaching quantum mechanics. And so the, the book sitting next to him, so he would drop me off my school before he went to the university. And there was always his book sitting next to him on the, in the car. And I would take the book and I would look quantum mechanics. And of course, as Elizabeth is saying, you know, math is this language. And to me, it was like trying to take a dictionary without the translation, right? So you, I'm looking at this, this all these, you know, well, it's Greek, in fact, in certain, you know, the symbols. Um, so for me, though, but it was so exciting, like, oh my gosh, this is this puzzle. Here is this mystery of uh, something that is happening in the universe and and this book is going to tell me uh how to solve that 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 mystery so for me it's that but also uh, you know um just even before that though I, all i can say i don't even know how i, I i've always been uh, looking up at the stars and just again from my first word light you know it, it's there in my name lucy uh like so, <laughs> i don't know i i so it was I not right for you lucy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and what about you heike it was also from the very beginning the motivation came later no i, I think it was pretty much also from the very beginning so i even though I was really good in sports and I was really also going into a very sportive career um, path, but there was always this backyard telescopes while growing up in Berlin, you basically don't see the sky. Uh, but we had the luxury of having a garden like 50 kilometers north of Berlin. And I, at some point, I don't know why, but I had this tel one a telescope, really cheap, <laughs> pretty shitty but it helped me look at uh, Jupiter and Saturn and it was amazing and then next thing I remember was that I had a much bigger telescope on the terrace of our new house and was watching the solar eclipse uh, mm -hmm. going over Berlin so it was just a partial eclipse but it was amazing and then I basically never questioned what I should study it was clear from the beginning it should be related mathematics and then at some point some teachers and family asked like what do you do with mathematics don't you want to 
study something real. And I said like, okay, then I do physics because, well, if I look at the book, what you have to study when you study physics, well, the first two years are basically just mathematics and that was perfectly fine. And then it went on and on and was like, it was always there. And I had also in high school and uh, primary school, I had physics teachers, which were women. Maybe that helped a little mm. bit, which was very rare. So that was also the only physics teacher we had as a female teacher. But in the end, that helped. So she had a PhD in physics and she was really great in teaching physics. And I think that helped me a lot of seeing, okay, well, it's easy if she explains it to me. Um, I can also explain it very in, in different words to my other uh, students and colleagues. So for me, that was always this education. Once you have understood something, when you are able to teach it, then you really start to realize that you really understood it before you were just repeating things which were said. So that was always driving me and why I always love still helping my colleagues, trying to explain it in a different way to them. So for me, that was always connected. And maybe it started with a backyard telescope outside of Berlin. I don't know. Actually, I, I can see some comments on all your stories. The first one is the curiosity that you were very curious at a young age. And, and the other one is that you were not afraid of trying. So you were not afraid of open a quantum mechanics book and go through it. You were not afraid of taking a telescope and look into that. Uh, you were not afraid of, of, of different things. You were willing to understand those things. No? And, and maybe that is also a, a key point, having this passion, trying uh, and if we fail, I mean, we always fail and, and we can try again. It's not that we can get it from the from the very beginning. But this Maybe is... I would, Alba, I would just make a very, very short comment because please. of what Lucy said that, I mean, her father was, was a physicist and she had this... Uh, this uh, this book you know, from what I, I was thinking. So my father was a lawyer and also my, my mom, she so uh, there were no physicists in my in, in my family ever. And I was thinking about what you said now. So I was not afraid, but I also had the help and support of my parents who didn't tell me what are you going to study physics? So they really left me free to choose uh, at the at the 100 percent level. And I think this was my personal luck, really, that uh, it was it, it's not for everyone. I mean, uh, I know it's uh, I was very, very lucky in this uh, in this sense to be able to go and study something really out of uh, the, so to say, what was known in my family. Yeah, absolutely, to have the, the support. So this is uh, kind of the, the positive note, but we know that there are some uh, challenges also in, in the field. Um, and I actually wanted to ask you, Lucy, uh, where you show in your presentation that you started being involved in science since already in the higher school. So all, for almost 40 years, you've been involved somehow in, in science. So I wanted to ask you, what are the, the challenges that you have seen through your career and, and especially how can we overcome them? Yes, well, um, so, you know, I, uh, in high school, well, we have established that I was going to study astronomy no matter what. Um, but, um, you know, when I took my high school physics course, there were three, young women, uh, myself included, and I think maybe 25 uh, guys. Uh, and so this, re you know, to remind you, this is back in the 1970s. Okay, so really try if you can. I know many of you listening, that's like ancient history. Okay, but, but it's really a point at which, um, you know, women, just to 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 uh, put a fine point on it, when I moved to CERN in the 80s, some cantons in Switzerland had only just given the vote to women. Um, there, I had to have 
a male come with me to a Swiss to open a bank account. Oh. Okay, so this is the state of the world in this era, in that era. That is not all that long ago, but this is the era that I am growing up in and trying to become a scientist. And so, you know, in my high school class, uh, my physics teacher, unfortunately, I did not have such a great physics teacher. Um, I probably he was maybe intimidated by me or something. I don't know, but he kept putting me down in the class. He would uh, make me an example in the class. He would say, well, if Lucy can do this, anybody can do this. Uh, this kind of really not good things, okay. So this is what I mean by, in my slides, perseverance and passion. So, and that's just over my time in the field, one after the other, uh, being told that I did not belong. So just really doing your best not to listen to those voices, but to listen to your own voice and, your, and build your own confidence uh, to keep pursuing your passion. Um, and to me, this was, you know, if you want to take the positive spin on it, I'm seeing more and more and more as, you know, the field is growing and growing, more women are joining. I'm so happy to see so many women now who don't even think of, of this as a, really an issue as, as much. They're not experiencing some of these really terrible uh, comments. Um, so for me, it's this uh, challenge of supporting women who still are feeling this kind of um, imposter syndrome or feeling they don't belong because somehow society is telling them they don't belong. Or maybe in Elizabeth's case, maybe perhaps the parents were not supporting uh, the child to pursue this for whatever reason. So there are many challenges, um, but I think there's, numbers now we are more and more and more and i think the more we are the more positive role models there are the easier it becomes to convince uh, young women that it's okay you just follow your dream and it will be okay if girls out there they have a teachers like yours we can be their support system we can show them that women belong in, in science as well so thanks a lot. Uh, let's close this uh, block. We are moving to the last one, which is about science education. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we are going to talk on, on different approaches from citizen science to, to art. And I wanted to start this also with a general um, question, which is actually why is, 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 is uh, science education important and like, how can we engage more people how can we bring more people to to the system so i i don't know lucy if you are tired of closing the previous section but as a co-founder of su universe I, I really want to hear from you your your input your feedback yeah, no, th thank you. And uh, again, as we've already alluded to in many of our uh, answers before that, um, I mean, science education, uh, well, of course, it impacted us, uh, both in positive and in some cases, negative ways. Uh, but um, really, at the core of education, it's this idea of engaging, uh, whether it's students in the formal classroom setting, or um, anybody, the public, in an informal setting. Um, and so it's, to me, the core of education is engagement. How, how can we uh, inspire? How can we ignite the spark of curiosity or, or fan the flames of curiosity for those who already have the spark? Uh, and so um, one way that I, in some sense, was... Uh, lucky that I was the right person at the right time, at the right place um, at the other planetarium um, to be working with these ideas of uh, having the public engage in science, like f figuring out this puzzle of how do you get the public to think more about science, uh, to engage with science so they care, uh, not just about uh, science um, 
but are you know thinking about the the wonders of the universe and these sort of things. So this is where you know founding the the Zooniverse, um, and uh, I. You know, I, maybe we don't have time to go into it too much, but I just want to say that the uh, Zooniverse platform, we now have over two and a half million volunteers uh, worldwide uh, that are contributing to science. And the, it is not in divorced from the research. In fact, it is contributing directly to research that many uh, teams, over 400 teams are actually working on uh, right now. So uh, as an example, as I mentioned in my introductory slides, um, we are using it to help develop a calibration pipeline because humans are really good, the volunteers are really good at distinguishing um, uh, the so-called muon rings, the way the muons interact with the system. Uh, you, they, they create a ring uh, of light uh, and it's easy for humans to see these rings. In fact, actually, uh, if you don't mind just sharing my screen again, I have, I can. It's easy for me to 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 show that. Yeah. Um, so just like this, this is a, a the interface that we used, and so this is a ring from a muon, and the um, the pipelines uh, that are made only by machines can miss some of the muons. Uh, whereas the humans are actually able to see them quite easily. And so we launched this project, uh, Muon Hunter. It was a, a, a fantastic success. Two million classifications, 6,000 people contributing to it. We finished it within uh, two months. Um, there's this engagement strategy, getting on social media, this kind of thing, helping people learn about the science of gamma ray uh, physics so that's great that's what i mean by you know engaging people they get interested in contributing they learn about the science uh and then uh through talk being able to speak directly with a researcher and this is something we have found in my work at the planetarium in my work with zooniverse people want to talk with scientists they they feel somehow separated from us and they, they, some, it's so we're up on this pedestal somehow. I don't know why. Um, but the more we can do to directly communicate with the members of the, of the public, explaining how we got where we are, just like we're doing now, explaining the science, answering questions. Maybe they're going to feel dumb because they're going to ask a question that is, they think may be obvious. No, there are no dumb questions. So this kind of, ability to talk directly through the Zooniverse platform with people who are helping our research is yet another uh, evidence for how the power of engagement and education. So I leave it there. I, there's so much more to say, but I leave it there and I <laughs> uh, can uh, jump in. But I really love this engagement as, as you see it in a, in a two way, you know, that at the end science education is not just about giving a talk uh, and that's it, but it needs actually the interaction and things like Zooniverse, sorry, I, I don't know, Zooniverse, <laughs> the pronunciation of that, uh, it, it actually uh, takes that two, two way uh, feedback to another level because it's making really uh, it's forcing people to be part of the research so they are actually part of the science of producing yeah. the, the science so it's ex extremely uh, extremely interesting i wanted to also ask you elisabetta you show that you spent uh, a lot of time also on on this and sometimes this is not within the contracts or within our initial <laughs> uh, <laughs> goals so why taking part of your research to do science education why is important for you it, it's exactly like like lucy was just saying so i think one of our uh, most important moments uh, apart from all of the works with the high school and this maybe we can discuss it later is um, this European Researchers' Night. So it's actually it's not a night because we start, we have so many things to say and to communicate that over the years we, st we started even earlier and now we start in the early morning and then we go on until midnight. <laughs> and 
uh, it's really uh, as, just like Lucy was saying, so it's filling the gap. So it's people that are extremely curious of who we are, what we do, because we are we are usually doing it uh, in the city. We are bringing our detectors, we are bringing our instrumentation, we are bringing our computers, we are showing, we are making people touch what we are really doing. And there are so many questions, so many curiosities by the public uh, who wants to know what we are doing and also would like to do something and in this respect going a step, a step backwards towards the engagement that that we were discussing so this uh, uh, citizen project i was thinking also about the period uh, of uh, let's say the pandemic that we all went through unfortunately for the last couple of years and there were a nice, uh, um, for example, um, things that could be done, uh, for example, for the night sky pollution. So there was an initiative about uh, using your mobile phone in order to test how uh, the, there is uh, too much light, for example, in uh, in the cities. Uh, as, as, as Ike was saying, in Berlin, it's very difficult to see the stars. Also in Bari, I mean, it's uh, all the center of the cities are very much light polluted. And so uh, engaging uh, uh, a broader public in order to make a measurement with a mobile phone, it's something easy, but anyway, to make a measurement and understand uh, how much there is this problem, for example, of light pollution for astronomy, but also also for animals, uh, also for nature. There is there, there are many, many problems that are maybe more next to the sensitive sensibility of society. And this is something important. So you teach the people something through engaging them by making, for example, a measurement, making them feel like a scientist for a day and contributing with their measurement to produce uh, maybe a graph or something, a map of the night of the night pollution or night uh, sky pollution in that uh, in that uh, in the specific case. And this was done, for example, I remember I do it did it from my balcony during the pandemic in which we couldn't even go outside and do, let's say, and do something more. Uh, and another thing that I wanted to say, for example, there is uh, wh when uh, the uh, gravitational wave inter interferometers also started, there was another pro side program that made uh, the public uh, uh, go and look for more data, for more signals within the data. There are some programs, I mean, that can it's not, let's say, gamma ray astrophysics, but it's again in that direction. So if people are curious, can go and dig into the data. Now the interferometers are shut down since the pandemic. So we are waiting since some years, but they will become online again this May, crossing fingers. And so this may be another way in order to teach to, to get more uh, near to the people, because again, gravitational waves is another pretty difficult concept to let's say to explain to a, to a general public but through these kind of things you can try to reach a little bit more the people and make them feel part of our scientific community let me keep delving on on this elisabetta you're talking a lot about the the general public and you mentioned for example doing it through some international observances like the european researchers night and so but sometimes uh, it doesn't matter if you are, uh, belong in a, in a small group, if you are part of a small group or you are part of a large infrastructure, uh, we always have some constraint, time, uh, staff, uh, resources, and so on. So one of the questions would be, would it make sense to target an audience, a specific audience in science uh, communication, what level of education should we target, for example, or, or should we try to do them all, try to focus? What's your opinion on that? Well, well, we go back to what I showed on that slide. I mean, uh, the first line that I had, actually, the European research Network was number two. <laughs> so number one was all of what we are doing, it's, for example, here locally, but I know also, for example, so Heike said it uh, with uh, schools. So we have several programs. Uh, actually, we have programs also towards elementary school, because you, you asked me what level. And we have several of our, my colleagues uh, that are bringing very simple experiments also at elementary school in order to start already 
at a very young age, if, if someone is not like me that is already, so to say, super curious because of whatever reason, uh, and to try to bring already this kind of uh, very basic, uh, very little experiment, maybe something about magnetism uh, or electricity, you know, the very, the very beginning of uh, sparkling the curiosity through the elementary. So it's really important to start uh, from a very early stage uh, not too much, not insisting too much, but on a very mild way, just to keep it like a, a game uh, somehow. But then uh, at high school level, this is where we are really trying to give it all. Uh, so to really start uh, making people passionate about physics, about what is uh, the reason behind something, to really inspire people to pursue them uh, really maybe a career in STEM. And so we have many projects uh, with, uh, with high schools, uh, let's say the last years of high schools in which you can, people are getting more mature and I'm really starting questioning what should I do with my life <laughs> at some point, what should I study? So uh, from early on, but then I would say, then that's the moment in which you really need to push it. And we have several, for example, I don't know if Heike wants to comment about the International Cosmic Day because it's really going into that uh, into that direction. Yeah, I, I think just like trying to bring the experiments or part of the experiments to the students, let them discover on their own what they want. So in the beginning, the, the International Cosmic Day, for example, we started with a very clear school book like working atmosphere so we had everyone was given the same task like can you please measure muons which are coming and check from which direction they are coming and then we let the students uh, exchange on these ideas and on the results but it was really like from the school book and now we changed that a little bit shifted the focus in order to make the students more of a experience how the work of a scientist is namely that there is not the one question and according to protocol you have to do this 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 and this but that you can be a little bit more free a little bit more experimenting giving the students also the chance to fail by just observing and seeing my experiment didn't work so because my cloud chamber which i tried to build up there was no cloud in the cloud chamber, so you cannot see any muons or any alpha or any neutrinos. And this was this is something I experienced that the students take this feeling of they had the chance to explore things on their own, something which the students, this feeling they take home. It's not about the failure, it's really that they had the chance to explore something and I think this is something which more and more we have to also show them that all scientists, if they are good scientists, they will fail because they will ask questions which nobody knows the answer to. And I think giving this into schools, into maybe even telling or showing that to the teachers, because we also do teacher training um, and we let them experiment. And I think sometimes teachers are worse than the students because they give up very fast. Oh, I understood that. They don't even let themselves fail on something because they think they understood. While a student is always like still trying to repeat. And so I think also starting with the teachers to show them that scientists are not those professors which are super high level, super well educated. They know the answers to everything. I think giving everyone the also the, the real life experience that also scientists fail most of the time. Um, we are just good in continuing and asking the next questions after each other. So I think this experience, if we can transport that into the public by whatever means we have, I think this is really important. At, at the end, make it them part of, of this research, of the experiments, and so they can learn also how to be independent. And, and that is where the curiosity comes, the perseverance comes, when you get it right, when you get it wrong. And, and I like very much the idea of 
including uh, the entire school, because I think that also helps, for example, breaking stereotypes, no? like if this is for a man's field or, or this is for a woman, no, let's break all these stereotypes, the sciences for, for everybody, and we can all fail and we can all get it uh, right. And, and we should uh, push for, for that when we are failing. So let's, uh, I'm going to, to stay with you, uh, Heike, actually, because my next question, we are talking about a, a much more technical approach, let's say, you know, with Suniverse, uh, with uh, the, the, the cosmic uh, ray day that we have, uh, we see the experiments, we, we work with them and so, but let's uh, talk about how to engage people through art, I mean, you show it, you are not only a, a, an astrophysicist, a background a expert in computing, but you are also a science illustrator. So a question would be, uh, how can art help bring uh, science to, to people? Well, I think in many ways, the, the way art touches everyone, um, it's, it's out there, right? So if you look, let, let's take one step back and say, like, I did some illustrations for Science Magazine in order to illustrate among scientists, because the reader of Science Magazines are mostly the scientists themselves. But sometimes scientists have problems with explaining things easily or abstracting things such that they are easily understandable. So one thing which helps are illustrations in that sense. And it's always fun to work with theorists, which are usually just like thinking in equations and try to convince them to put that into an image. So this is fun experience. I can really, there are lots of good stories about that. Um, but in the end, the theorists always want to have their like the real thing to be shown also inside the illustration. But if you go a little bit back, you have to make it much more abstract. You have to cut down on lots of details in order to make the picture coherent. And I think this is also where then at some point art starts to come in because art has the chance of going as abstract as you want. Gamma ray sources right now, as we have them, we don't have a clear picture of how they look like. We don't have the full potential of like beautiful pictures of the James Webb, which just went viral over the past months and the, the last year, which were picked up by everyone. In gamma ray astronomy, we do not yet have them, but art can help us to bring them also to a broader audience. So I think art is in that way, a little bit more of connecting via emotions which science illustration is a little bit more of making things a little bit easier to understand. But if you connect with art, then it's just something you can enjoy. And if there's something shown which you don't know, um, maybe you pick it up and you show it to your uh, colleague next door, your, your neighbor and say, look at this thing, what is that? And then you can start getting more people interested in what is the James Webb telescope? How does a black hole really look? Like, why is this image so blurry? And I think these things are great. Like visuals are really great, at least to engage more people to show like, look, this is the greatest discovery we just made. And if people start talking to their neighbor in the in the train, like, have you seen this image? This is just beautiful. Um, I think that's all we need. And then you can start starting the discussion with, with people and identify yourself as a scientist or someone interested in science and you get the discussion started. Can really work as a simplification no, of, of this very complex concept that we manage sometimes in, in physics. As you, you said, start a conversation. I love that. Like you really can uh, uh, set the first step to start a conversation with the public through through art. So it's kind of complementary, no, to 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 science in that sense. 
Yes, and, and art has also many forms. It's not only images, right? You can also have a theater play or lyrics about the beauty of the night sky. So there's lots of art ways of describing the night sky or describing things in the universe. Um, so even a theater play can transform science into art. Absolutely. By the way, if you did not realize when Heike was doing the presentation, some of the illustrations were in, in her slides. So if you miss them, go back to the video once we finish and have a look because they are absolutely amazing and, and beautiful. So you can actually see this sparkling passion for science when you see uh, Heike's uh, illustration. So let's finish with this uh, round table. Let's finish with, with the event with um, one question. Um, one of the, the main values for CTO is, uh, of course, the, 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 the inclusion, the diversity. Actually, this, this event is part of a major project called Astro Diversity, um, where we, we try to foster, where we try to put our two cents in this international effort to, to search for a more, uh, for a field that, that, for the equity in the field at the end. So coming to the, the education, um, a question is how can we make, how can we use the science education to make science more inclusive? So Elisabetta, if you want to start answering. Well, uh, I was actually in this respect, I was thinking about what uh, Lucy told us about her experience uh, back uh, between the 70s and the 80s. And I was thinking about, for example, my experience, but I assume also the one of Heike. Uh, so it's true, we were all born and we were all raised in different countries. So this is also something that depends really very much on uh, on the country that you're born into and on the country where you are studying. So there are many factors. And I was studying in Italy, in Germany and in Austria. And I saw this kind of um, maybe, let's say, the inclusive, inclusive uh, problem a little bit more accentuated here and there. I have to say in Italy, I again feel uh, I am pretty lucky because from, my very, from the very beginning, there was a really an equal, um, let's say, number of uh, uh, female and male students, for example, from the very beginning of my physics studies. Uh, it's true we were a little less uh, female, but then going into astrophysics, uh, this um, changed really a little bit. And I, I think one important thing is having uh, teachers. This is something that I am just repeating things and gathering things that we already already discussed a little bit, putting them all together. Uh, having teachers uh, that are uh, treating, let's say, all of the students the same way from the early stages, because, and I go back again, Mathematics is a, the, a language for everyone. It's not a language for male students, female students, or other, whatever students. I mean, it's a universal, the, the most universal language for everyone, for every human being, for, for everything, also for nature, because it's mathematics is also language for nature. So if you start from this point of view as a teacher and you give uh, you 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 transmit this idea to all of the students it's not that uh, study physics is more of uh, something for someone than something else i mean it's a universal basics for everyone and i think we are already things improved a lot because i myself didn't have the experience for example of lucy and I found much more equal, uh, let's say, uh, surroundings uh, through all the institutes also that I visited uh, around uh, Europe, basically, but also in the times I spent, uh, for example, in the US. Uh, and this is getting better and better. There is for sure lots to do. And I, I don't know if the others also wants to com want to comment in this, but I think we are moving in the world in the right direction already. I don't know if Lucy, Heike, you want to comment on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just echoing a lot of what has already been said, but I, I, it, it, 
you know, that we can use data. We know how to use data. Uh, so we have to collect the data and we have to analyze the data. And then like any system, we have to understand where the data are pointing us to. So if we are seeing, for example, uh, young women starting to take physics, like this is something that the American Institute of Physics did a survey some years ago and found that many uh, women start almost equal in number uh, in the first year of physics in college. But by the end, there are very few. Uh, and so this is, this is data. This is telling us something. Okay, so now we have to look at the, the instrument. What is the system? And how is the system failing, uh, you know, these women? What is it? So do more surveys, uh, do exit interviews. It's hard work, but it's necessary work. Um, and then in a dispassionate way, you know, own the problems. Realize if there is, um, you know, systemic sexism or racism or what have you uh, to just say, okay, that is where we are. Now we have to make the choices to to fix uh, the these issues. I wish we could do it in this dispassionate way, but unfortunately, <laughs> when you were, when it comes to really uh, uh, making changes, uh, sometimes the system really resists uh, making changes. Um, so again, I come back to the theme for me, which is perseverance. And, and passion, you, 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 you just keep uh, pushing and you keep trying and you find ways to engage with uh, the students. As I said earlier, there are more and more women in the field. So we have more and more opportunity to create environments that are uh, positive for young women. We can have conversations one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, we can, watch and we can see, okay, there's something funny going on there. Uh, let me just ask a quick, quick you know, quick question. Uh, nothing invasive, but just a, a way of showing, uh, I see you. I see that you are um, trying. Uh, and here's my door, it's open. Uh, so just these little tiny things can go a long way. Uh, to really helping uh, increase, you know, making um, science and physics and astrophysics more more inclusive. Uh, so both on the individual level, but also on the larger level, trying to be as data driven as possible, and then putting the data in front of people in the system to show them, look, we really do have to make these changes creating this support system and ask for, for changes at the end. I don't know, Heike, you want to add something? Yeah, it's basically also like be as open as possible. So there are more and more funding opportunities which and also ask a colleague how they get there, what obstacles, like really trying to be have an open door for students, try to encourage them, try also to encourage your colleagues if they see something um, happening to be actually even make them aware because some of the things uh, we are still facing these days is that you have an unconscious bias on some of these things and maybe you're not even aware of it. So the more open we are and the more we talk about and more and more borders maybe some bricks go away once we are all together and trying to celebrate our diversity in science and in general so i think there's a lot of things small steps um, and big steps and hopefully at some point we don't have a woman in science day anymore because we don't need mm -hmm. to talk about it more anymore so that would be great <laughs> even though i really enjoy this event <laughs> but maybe maybe that's that should be the goal absolutely well let's close here the event i would be talking 
to you three, four hours, <laughs> but I think we need to go to have dinner and have uh, lunch. So let's close it here. And, and I wanted to close it if you can give us just a very short statement, kind of a sentence to leave the public or or to inspire the, the girls or women that are watching us um, right now. So I, I'm going to do the same order as the introduction. So Lucy. It's what I've been saying all along, just uh, perseverance, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't let, as we have a saying in America, don't let the turkeys get you down. Just, <laughs> you know, keep, keep going, believe in yourself and take your passion and find your voice and keep going. Love that, Elisabetta. Statement. Yes, I would. I cannot repeat what Lucy just said. I, I would say yeah, to simply follow. Well, simply to follow your dreams. So if there is something that you love very much, just do it and without even thinking too much. This is another point that maybe people start. No, oh, well, should I do? Should I not do? Just go for it. Go for it without so many. So. If you want to travel, if you want to explore, if you want to find out things, just go for it. So this is my my statement. I love that. And Heike, a final statement. Yeah, as the last one, it's probably the hardest. Um, <laughs> basically, stay curious and try to reach for the stars or whatever else dream you have. And don't let anyone else tell you what you cannot do because probably it's just, you can do it if you really want to do it. Just go for it and yeah, be curious all the time. So thanks a lot. I actually love, love these statements. I want to do a poster for each one and put it in my, in my office. Uh, let's close the, the event here. Uh, Lucy, Elisabetta, Heike, thanks a lot for joining us in the Women of CTA. I really, really enjoyed the, the discussion. Let me also thank Megan, who is in the backstage, helping us with all the, the banners and the transition. Uh, also, thank you to the IAU Office for Astronomy Outreach, who supported this event. And of course, big thanks to the, to the audience because uh, they stay with us this evening for sharing this afternoon and evening with us. Um, stay tuned to our channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, website, everything. We share there all the news, so you can have a look there for, for future events. And see you soon, and of course, see you in the next Women of CTA. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. bye.